I'd like to welcome Professor Simon Lloyd, um, skull based surgeon and consultant neurologist. Is that O in the middle? Neurotologist um, with his talk. Thank you, Simon. Hi, it's very nice to meet you all. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to come in to speak today. Um, I'd, I'd like to speak to you about ways that we can rehabilitate hearing in NF2. Um, so if we could bring up the uh, slide and just go to the next one, please. Thank you. So first of all, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about anatomy, just so that you can understand a bit more about what we're talking about. And then I'll go through what the scale of the problem is within the NF2 population and then talk through some of the solutions that we have for hearing loss, particularly focusing on cochlear implantation and auditory brainstem implantation and talk about the outcomes that we can expect from those two really important interventions for our NF2 patients. So next slide, please. So um, many of you will probably be familiar with the anatomy of the ear, but you've got um, three parts to it. You've got the outer ear, which is the pinna and the ear canal. And then you've got the middle part, which is the middle ear. That's the eardrum, two hearing bones that cross the space behind the uh, eardrum. Um, and they contact the inner ear, which consists of the hearing organ, which is the cochlea, and the balance organ, which is situated just behind the cochlea. And then from the cochlea runs the vestibular and cochlear nerves um, that uh, take the signals from the cochlea to the brain that allow you to hear sound. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and this is just a very simple schematic of where the signals from the hearing nerve go. They run up through the brain stem into the main part of the brain. And you can see the auditory cortex uh, which is just on the uh, outer part of the brain there in the temporal lobe. Next slide, please. So the problem in NF2 um, isn't with the sound getting from the outside world to the inner ear. The problem lies with the inner ear itself. Um, and you can see here a typical example of somebody with NF2 with bilateral vestibular schwannomas that um, will have inevitably caused some degree of hearing loss. Next slide, please. Um, so with NF2, the problem either lies with the cochlea itself or it lies, next slide, please, with the vestibular cochlear nerve. Uh, next slide, please. And there's lots of reasons why people uh, with NF2 have problems with those two areas. So for the cochlea itself, uh, you can get interruption to the blood supply uh, through pressure from the tumor. Uh, you can get direct pressure or invasion of the cochlear nerve because of the adjacent tumor. And you can also get chemical damage through a blockage of the flow of the fluid around the tumor. Um, that's called CSF. And also production of substances by the tumor that actually chemically damage the uh, cochlear nerve. But also, unfortunately, as a result of the, the treatments that we offer for vestibular schwannomas, we can either damage the nerve through radiotherapy that uh, results from inflammation, or we can damage the cochlear nerve by having to physically remove it as part of the process of treating a vestibular schwannoma surgically. Next slide, please. So what's the scale of the problem? Well, um, this was a, a study that we did uh, a few years ago now, um, which uh, summarizes in the UK population the distribution of hearing loss amongst uh, um, the, the entire UK population. So you can see um, at the top there that 68% of patients pretty much have normal or close to normal hearing, and we call that grade one. And then grades two, three, and four get progressively worse as judged by people's ability to hear everyday sounds. Um, and there are 12% of patients that fall into that group. And then there's a larger um, cohort of patients that have really profound hearing, about 20% of patients um, that either have no hearing at all and have had no implants or they've had implantation to rehabilitate their hearing. Next slide, please. And there's lots of options in terms of hearing re rehabilitation. I'm not going to dwell too much on hearing aids and um, the second and third options there, um, just to touch on them briefly. But I'm going to focus mainly on cochlear implants and auditory brainstem implantation. So next slide, please. 
Um, just so you can understand how we assess hearing, this is an audiogram. And on this axis, you've got the sound intensity in decibels. And on this axis, you've got the frequency of sound. So low frequency and high frequency. And we drop the sound intensity at each different frequency to the level at which you can just hear it. And we mark that threshold as a red circle for the right ear and a blue cross for the left ear. And anything from naught to 20 is regarded as normal. So you can see in the low frequencies, in this case, that the hearing is normal. But as you go towards the higher frequencies, the hearing deteriorates. And uh, this is somebody that would be completely um, able to have hearing rehabilitation with a, with a hearing aid. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this is a slightly different situation. It's the same sort of audiogram, slightly different um, design. But you can see here that on the right-hand side, you've got normal hearing. But on the left-hand side, you've got the hearing thresholds right down at 110, 120 decibels. So they can't hear anything with the left ear, but they can hear well with the right ear. Next slide, please. And what we can do in this situation is we can transfer sounds from the completely deaf ear to the good ear, um, either using um, something called a cross aid, a contralateral rerouting of sound where the, there's a hearing aid in the deaf or a microphone in the deaf ear, and then a speaker in the hearing ear, and that then allows them to hear sounds on the deaf side in the good ear. Um, or we can use a number of different types of implantable device where you implant a screw or a device into the bone of the skull, and then there's vibrations that are generated by the hearing implant, and those vibrations go through the skull directly to the other side. So next slide, please. And there's a, a, lots of different devices on the market at the moment. This is the the most common and the, the most um, uh, the, the device that's been used for the, the longest period of time. It's called a bone anchored hearing aid, and it's just simply a titanium screw in the skull. And then this hearing aid actually vibrates and those vibrations go through the, the, the screw into the skull. This is a, a different design, one of the more recent designs that doesn't have the screw sticking out through the skull. And there's a little vibrating crystal inside here. So the processor on the outside picks up sound, transfers a signal through, through the skin without the need for any um, screw or anything like that. And that then stimulates the crystal to vibrate and those vibrations move to the other side through the skull again. Okay, next slide. So um, all of those situations are for people that have got some degree of hearing. Um, but if you've got really profound hearing loss, those options aren't possible because you can't actually physically get enough sound into the cochlea for them to be able to hear it. And this is the sort of audiogram that we're talking about. So this patient's got a little bit of residual hearing in the low frequencies, but as you get towards the high frequencies, both ears start to get to below 90 decibels and they won't be able to get very much benefit from a normal hearing aid. Next slide, please. And uh, it's really this group at the bottom of that chart that I showed you before. So in NF2, we've got about 24% of our patients that fall into a category that would require some kind of auditory implantation. Okay, next slide, please. And for those people that still have a cochlea or have a functional cochlear nerve, we can use a cochlear implant to electrically stimulate the cochlea where we are unable to stimulate them auditorily. So, and this is a typical example of a cochlear implant. There's lots of different devices on the market, but essentially this is the electronics package that goes underneath the skin behind the ear. And then this electrode is inserted into the cochlea and you can probably just about make out lots of little electrodes along the end of it. And that, that allows electrical signals that are frequency specific to be sent into the cochlea. And they then are picked up by the cochlear nerve and the patient can then hear. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and this is just a schematic of what it looks like when it's in. So this is the implantable part here that's in the cochlea. Um, there's a processor that either goes behind the ear or there's a more recent design that's just off the ear where this sort of coil structure is here. The processor picks up sound, sends an electrical signal by radio uh, into, the, into the receiver stimulator under the skin, and that then splits up the sound into different frequencies, and that um, then stimulates the cochlear nerve. Okay, next slide. And this is the UK's criteria for cochlear implantation. So anybody that has hearing below 80 decibels in this sort of mid range 
is is a candidate for cochlear implantation um, in the UK. Although in NF2, we are able to kind of stretch that because the funding streams are slightly different. Okay, next slide. Um, and this is just a, a, a brief slide on what's involved with the cochlear implant surgery. So we make a cut behind the ear. We have to drill away a little bit of bone behind the ear that allows us to get access to the cochlea. Um, we slide the uh, electronics package underneath the skin. Next slide, please. Um, so the bone's been removed behind the ear. There's a tiny little hole drilled into the middle ear space where the cochlea is situated. And you have to drill away a little bit of bone to expose one of the membranes that is into the inner ear. Um, you, when the drills away, you can see the, the membrane. So this is the membrane here. And you have to make a little opening in that membrane. And then the electrode is slid in through that hole. So this is the fluid that's within the inner ear, just a little bit of it coming out. And you can see the electrode just very gently being passed through that hole and it just curls around the cochlea. It's like a snail shell. Okay, next slide, please. So that's cochlear implants, but unfortunately with NF2, there's a lot of people that can't have a cochlear implant because either their cochlea isn't functioning and it's not implantable, or more commonly, the uh, uh, cochlear nerve has been removed uh, as part of surgery to remove vestibular schwannomas. Next slide, please. So in that situation, we use something called an auditory brainstem implant, where we essentially stimulate the hearing pathways of the brain upstream within the brainstem. Um, and this is an example of an auditory brainstem implant. And you'll see it's a pretty similar design to a cochlear implant, except that the electrodes are arranged in a slightly different way. They're in a paddle um, rather than in a linear arrangement. And you'll see why you have to use it that way um, in a subsequent slide. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to go into the neuroanatomy because it's really complicated, but um, the uh, area of the brain that we stimulate with an, uh, an auditory brainstem implant is just in the brain stem. And luckily, uh, the cochlear nucleus, which is the area that we're stimulating, is quite accessible through a little opening in the side of the brain stem. So we can pass the electrode through that hole and put it in contact with the surface of the cochlear nucleus. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, oh, I'll just press it again and it sort of shows you a little bit of graphic. Yeah, next one, next one. So it basically goes into that hole and stimulates the cochlear nucleus from there. Okay, next one, please. And this is just a video again. Okay, so in this case, there's been a, a big amount of bone removed from behind the ear to get access uh, to remove the vestibular schwannoma and the tumor has been removed. And this is the brain stem here. And this is the back part of the brain called the cerebellum. So we push the back part of the brain down. And this is that, that whiter area that you saw is the cochlear nucleus. Um, and that is the electrode being slid into the little hole adjacent to the cochlear nucleus. And those little electrodes then stimulate different areas of the surface of the cochlear nucleus. Okay, next one, please. Okay, so just quickly on outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, the main aim, obviously, is to try and restore somebody's ability to hear everyday sounds and spoken language, but also try and get people back to work and trying to increase their confidence and their independence in their everyday lives. Next slide, please. And this is a summary of um, the, the Manchester cochlear implant patients' uh, outcomes over a 15-year period, not just NF2, but everybody. Um, you can see the speech discrimination scores here from 0%, which is really bad, to 100%, which is really good, um, spread across the, the various years. And you can see that the vast majority of patients with their cochlear implant score 70 to 100%, which is a really good outcome. Obviously, there are some that don't get quite such good outcomes. Um, and the reason I put that up is just to compare for later on when you see the NF2 outcomes. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so we've recently completed a, a review of the UK's cochlear implant experience, and it's the largest in the world. And we've got 64 patients with cochlear implants in NF2. And um, we've essentially got four groups of patients. We've got those that have had their vestibular schwannomas 
treated conservatively, so no surgery or radiotherapy. Those that have had surgery but have had their cochlear nerves preserved, those that have had radiotherapy, and then those that have been treated medically with bevacizumab. Next slide, please. And we looked at their audiological outcomes, so their speech scores um, with and without lip reading. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so this is the various different types of tumor treatment. So conservative radiotherapy, surgery, medical therapy, and those that have had multiple different types of tumor. Next slide, please. Um, and this is the first slide on outcomes. So you will have seen in the first slide, looking at the whole group of cochlear implant patients, that the vast majority get a lot of benefit from their cochlear implant. But in NF2, that isn't the case. There's about 20% of people that don't really get very much uh, benefit from a cochlear implant and then stop using it. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and you can see here um, the number of people that are full-time users, part-time users, non-users, etc. So um, these are the, the um, non-users, about 10%. This is the group that didn't get anything from their implant and eventually had them removed. So that makes up another 10%. So there's about 20% of people that, that end up not really making any benefit from it. Next slide. Um, and these are the speech discrimination outcomes. So you don't have to worry too much about it um, because uh, it's, it's complicated explaining what all of the different tests are. But if you look at the group that had no um, treatment for their vestibular schwannomas compared to the surgery group, the radiotherapy group and the bevacizumab group, you can see that there looks like there's a gradual decline. So if you're not having any treatment, you get a better outcome. If you've had surgery with preservation of your cochlear nerve, you get a similar outcome to radiotherapy and similar again with bevacizumab. And, and actually, although it looks like there's a gradual decline, statistically, there was not any difference between those groups. Next slide. So that's cochlear implants. And uh, these are the outcomes for brainstem implants. Next slide, please. Um, we've done 82 um, and ABIs in Manchester. We're one of two centers in the UK that, that do uh, auditory brainstem implants. Next slide, please. And uh, this is the crux of the, the results. So um, if you imagine back to the, the cochlear implant outcomes where people were scoring sort of 60, 70 percent, um, th this is the outcomes that you get with the ABI alone. So without lip reading, you only get 11%. So much worse outcomes with an auditory brainstem implant compared to a cochlear implant. So if we can use a cochlear implant, then we will. Um, but unfortunately we can't for a lot of our patients. Where they do, uh, uh, where they are very helpful is as an aid to lip reading. So you can see here, if you've added lip reading into the, um, into the scheme, they score 48%. So the ABI is, a, is an adjunct to lip reading, really helping people um, with hearing everyday sounds and also helping hearing speech through lip reading. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, this is another study we did just comparing with the global literature. So um, you've got the Manchester or the UK outcomes here, um, the lit world literature here. This is cochlear implant outcomes, radiotherapy um, uh, and cochlear implants, surgery and cochlear implants and brainstem implantation. And you can see that if you have no treatment of your vestibular schwannoma, you score about 70%. If you have radiotherapy, you score 36%. Um, if you've had surgery, it's 52%. And with the brainstem implant, 11%. Okay, next slide. So just to summarize, um, we are very fortunate in the current um, climate that we're able to offer hearing uh, rehabilitation options for most of our NF2 patients, some of them better than others. Um, but the decision-making around implantation is complex and, and we will always try and achieve the best possible outcome for our patients. But sometimes we, our hand is forced and have to resort to brainstem implantation, which does only have quite limited outcomes. Okay, thank you very much.